Okay, today we're going to be getting a little bit crazy and trying to recreate Schrodinger's cat experiment. So two videos ago, I dedicated an entire video to quantum superposition and explaining what that means. And that was all in preparation for this video right here. So I recommend if you haven't seen that video, I'll put a link in my description, head over there now, go check it out so you understand what quantum superposition actually is and then come back and watch this video and you'll understand a little bit better what's going on. So Schrodinger's cat experiment was a thought experiment proposed by Erwin Schrodinger, which was one of the founding fathers of quantum mechanics. And the reason he proposed this thought experiment is because it sh kind of showed the absurdness of quantum mechanics when viewed on a macro scale. So here's what Schrodinger proposed. He said, suppose you have a cat penned up in a steel cage. And in that cage with it, you have a Geiger counter, you have a radioactive substance, and you have this flask of hydrocyanic acid. So the setup goes like this. Your radioactive substance has an equal probability within one hour of decaying or not decaying. So if it does decay, it's connected to a device that knocks over this flask of hydrocyanic acid and it kills the cat. If it doesn't decay, then the cat's fine. And so your experimental setup is that when you go and check on your cat an hour later, you either find it dead or alive. That is your measurement. And so in between that measurement, it means that the atomic decay is in a state of superposition. It has both decayed and not decayed. And that means the cat is both dead and alive at the same time. It's in a superposition of being dead and alive. And it's not actually measured what it is until you open the box and look at whether the cat is dead or alive. And this entire experiment hinges on the fact that in quantum mechanics, things don't choose a specific state to be in until they're actually measured. In between measurements, they're always in a superposition. And this experiment brings that to the macro level by using a subatomic particle to kill something on a macro scale. So it seems like a logical paradox to say that the cat is both in a dead and alive state at the same time until you measure it. Well, today I'm going to bring that thought experiment to life and actually do this experiment. But instead of a cat for this experiment, I'm gonna be using some really annoying fruit flies from my house. And at the end, if quantum decay is in their favor, then I'll be releasing them. Okay, so I'm going to be using a Geiger counter here. And here's the readout of the Geiger counter. Every time you see a notch up in the graph here, that's detecting radioactive decay. You can see that sometimes it's at one, sometimes it's at two, and sometimes it's at three. It takes a data point every second. And so sometimes, every once in a while, there's gonna be three that decay in a second. Sometimes there's gonna be zero, and sometimes there's gonna be two, and sometimes there's gonna be one. So what is actually decaying here? Well, most of it is coming from radon in the air, and radon can undergo alpha decay, beta decay, or even gamma decay. That means that the radon in the air is actually in a superposition of decaying and not decaying until I measure it with my Geiger counter and I'm observing the measurement. And so I wrote a little program that says if there are ever three clicks within a second, then it's gonna turn on a smart device and the smart device is gonna trigger my vacuum chamber. Okay, so my setup is I have this smart plug here and it's connected to my vacuum pump. And so if the Geiger counter hits three clicks within a second, then this happens. Turns on. And in my vacuum chamber, I have two fruit flies that have been bugging me in my house. I finally caught them, put them in here to join in my experiment with me today. And if my vacuum chamber is turned on for more than about five minutes, then the fruit flies definitely won't survive in there with no oxygen. And so it's essentially killing the fruit flies if that happens. And so what I'm going to do is I'm gonna leave the fruit flies in my experiment for five minutes. I'm gonna leave the room and then I'm going to come back and check whether the fruit flies are dead or alive. And so the fruit flies in between this, according to Schrodinger, should be in a state of superposition of both dead and alive because the decay of the radon atoms are not in a state until they're measured when I come and check on them by checking on whether they're dead or alive in here. Okay, we're gonna start the experiment. Three, two, one. And leaving the room. Okay, so I'm in here waiting for the results of the experiment. I'm far enough away from the room so I can't hear if the vacuum chamber is on or not. So basically the entire garage is my box that would be around Schrodinger's cat. So in this case, it's Schrodinger's flies. 
Okay, time's up. Let's go check on the flies. All right, coming back in the room, I now observe the flies are not dead. Oh yes, and I can't forget that I need to let go of the subjects of my experiment here. Fate was in their favor tonight. Okay, so the question is, during this experiment, in between measurements, from the time I left the room to when I came back in to check on the flies, were the flies actually in a state of being both dead and alive? Were they in a superposition of dead and alive? Well, it's actually kind of a hard question to answer because it depends on what your interpretation of quantum mechanics is. It's very well defined that a measurement causes a quantum state to stop being in its current superposition. But the question that is left open to interpretation is what does it mean to be measured? In this experiment, basically what we had is three different things that we could count as measurement. We could say that the flies themselves were measuring themselves. Every moment the flies knew that they were not dead, that means that there were not three decays within one second. So basically just the fact that these flies are conscious and able to know whether they're dead or alive, that means that they were continually taking a measurement throughout the whole experiment. So they were never actually in a superposition. But if you don't think that the flies are actually conscious enough to know that, then maybe you could take it to mean that the Geiger counter is actually what the measurement is. So when the Geiger counter was able to actually sense whether it was getting to three or two or one within one second, that was the measurement. So every second that the Geiger counter did not get to three, that was a measurement. And so the flies were not in a state of superposition because this was always measuring it and it never got to three. But I don't know any of that actually happened until I actually checked on my experiment. So you could say that the measurement was not actually complete until I actually looked at it and saw the results of the experiment. So there was no measurement until I measured it. And so until I came into the room and checked on the flies, that means that the measurement was not complete yet. And in that case, that would mean that the flies were actually in a dead and alive superposition state. So what is it? Were the flies actually dead and alive at the same time in a superposition state? Or were they continually measuring themselves and they knew they were alive the whole time? Or was the Geiger counter saying they were alive the whole time? Or was it me who actually determined when I went in and measured whether they were dead or alive, what their final state was? Well, unfortunately, there's no answer to this question. The mathematics of quantum mechanics is such that you can call any one of these points a measurement and you can never know which one the measurement was because in order to check it, you have to check on the experiment yourself. For example, you could theoretically argue that no experiment was complete. Any quantum experiment that you ran, the results were not actually there, were not actually in a state of non-superposition until you looked at the results. Now this probably sounds absurd to say that everything's in a state of superposition until a specific conscious person like me is looking at it. And that's actually the point that Schrodinger was trying to make in his Schrodinger cat thought experiment. He was showing how absurd it is to say that the cat is actually in a state of dead and alive at the same time until someone like a person checks on it. And if this interpretation is actually true, it has some really weird effects on how we observe our universe. That basically means that the entire universe didn't actually exist in a real state until conscious beings were able to observe it. Now even the nature of a conscious being is open to interpretation. Does it have to be a human that could collapse the wave function? Can it be an animal? Can it be a fly? Well these are questions that basically leave the realm of science because it can't be determined in science whether or not you're the end causal chain of the quantum collapse of the wave function. There are other methods in quantum mechanics to explain this away, basically decoherence theory, and there's another similar theory called the Copenhagen interpretation that doesn't necessarily require a conscious observer to complete a measurement. But basically it's an open-ended question that doesn't have an answer in science. And that's why basically the mantra of quantum physicists is just shut up and calculate. Basically don't think about the interpretation of what it all means, but we know the math behind it and we know it works when we do the measurements and we know the probabilities. 
It doesn't matter whether you're a conscious observer or whether it's a device making the collapse of the wave function. We can never tell where the causal chain ends, so don't think about it. And so as a scientist, you don't necessarily have to choose an interpretation of quantum mechanics. You can just do the math and calculate the results. But it sure is fun to think about. Hey everybody, thanks for watching another episode of The Action Lab. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, remember to hit the subscribe button and hit the bell to be notified when my latest video's out. And if you haven't headed over to theactionlab.com, head over there now to check out the Action Lab subscription box. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.